episode, I spoke to Molly Scott Cato, who is a professor at the University of Roehampton, but also a politician and green activist. She served as an MEP, member of the European Parliament, and I thought it would be interesting to ask her about the experience of being a politician. But of course, mixed into our conversation is green economics issues. And I hope you enjoy the video. Before the fiddlers have fled before they ask us to pay the bill. Sure. Hey, um, so how long does it take to implement, or how long does it take to see your policy work come to fruition? Well, I think we have to understand that democratic politics is often quite limited in lots of different countries because there are a lot of vested interests. So I've been working in the area of environmental politics for, uh, you know, getting on for 40 years now. And um, the progress has been incredibly slow, I think, considering what I'm trying to achieve is just protecting um, environment for other species, you know, protecting habitats, making sure people don't suffer from various types of pollution and so on. These things should be easily implemented. But the reason they're not is that we have powerful corporations. Sometimes they're donating money to politicians. Sometimes they're just lobbying. You know, they're advertising. They're changing people's opinions. They're persuading them to take long distance flights and so on. So all of that really makes it slow to achieve the kind of political change that I want to see. I think if we think particularly about climate change, I mean, I think it's been it's been at least 30 years that I've been campaigning for serious action on climate change and it's only in 2015 that we got anything in terms of political commitment and this last November in Glasgow we had some progress but it's so slow even though everybody now agrees that that's the greatest crisis facing us all across the world um, we're still seeing you know blockages we're seeing fossil fuel companies still getting um, money to invest when they we know that that's what's causing the problem so yeah it's it's much much slower than I would like <laughs> let me just put it like that but maybe here's a contrasting example I worked when I was an MEP on um, um, antibiotic resistance on farms so essentially factory farming means animals very close together and the only way you can keep them healthy is by routinely giving them antibiotics even when they're not sick and that means that um, you're actually creating the perfect conditions for um, antibiotic resistance to grow and I think because people have realized that that is a threat to our mo public you know modern health system that, that was reasonably swift action to stop the overuse of antibiotics on farms. It didn't go far enough and it didn't go fast enough, but I would say maybe within five years that came through. So it, it really, how long it takes to make the change depends on the power of the forces ranged against you. If it's something that doesn't really get in anybody's way, like social changes, for example, like let's say gay marriage, it didn't really affect anybody in terms of their economic um, their potential to, to make profits or anything so that you didn't have those economic interests ranged against you, you could make progress there. But if you're up against, you know, the power of the fossil fuel companies, you're looking at decades and that's why we're in the climate crisis. And well, I guess following from that, how do you balance all the state actors and non-state actors? Um, what, what kind of processes do you have to, I guess, counter big companies or stuff like that? Well, that, that, I think the, the, that that's very weak. I think the companies have far too much power. I mean, I tried hard to get Exxon banned from the European Parliament, for example, because we knew they'd been deliberately distorting the information on climate change. We had evidence of that, but they were still allowed to come in and talk to politicians. So there, there hasn't until recently even been any attempt to make those meetings public. So people don't understand why politicians are making the decisions they're making because they don't see who's been lobbying them. <laughs> but I, I would go further than that, and I would really restrict the amount of times that politicians can meet the representatives from these big corporations, because, you know, right across the world, people are losing confidence in democracy as um, because they don't see it working in their interests. And in many ways, I think they're right about that. And we need to really strengthen our democracy. And that means limiting the power of these big corporations and really making it clear if politicians are taking donations from big companies or if they're you know, chatting with those big companies, essentially working on their behalf, 
and also if they leave, stop being politicians and then immediately go and work for those corporations or having worked for corporations come into political life as civil servants or political um, you know, advisors, that revolving door has to stop. You, know, you, you have to choose. If you're going to go into public life, then you choose to live on a lower income, to work for the public good, not to work for corporations and vice versa. That kind of interchange between the two and the revolving door is really undermining people's confidence in democracy. So that there are practical steps we could take to change that. But you know, the, the, the problem is the politicians we've got there now have learned to thrive in this system. So very largely, they support the system as it is now, even though as it, doesn't, as it works less well for citizens, citizens lose their confidence in democracy, which is a, a real problem in my country and right across the world. Okay. Um, and you've gotten to experience politics on an international level and on a domestic level. Um, what, what is different between the two? Well, it's not really a fair comparison because the British democratic system is so odd. You know, it's so atypical because we have this um, first past the post majoritarian electoral system. So it's effectively there's only two parties that can hold power in our system. And so as a green, um, you know, we, 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 it's very hard to win a seat because you have, we might have 10% support right across the country, but unless you can get 35% support in one place, you can't get elected. So we have only one MP who we've had for, for 12 years now, but we haven't managed to win yet in any other seat. So um, our domestic politics is really broken and we need to have a, a proportional system so that when people vote, their votes are translated fairly into seats. Um, but also the way our, our parliament works is very weird. So parliamentarians don't really have power to, to negotiate legislation. As a, as a member of the European Parliament, I was a legislator. So I worked, I could propose legislation, I could work on detailed legislation myself, and that was basically my job. And legislation went through committees and then it went to, um, to the full parliament and then it was negotiated with the commission and the um, council. Whereas in the UK, what happens is the government proposes a bill, it pushes it through Parliament using the majority it got through this dodgy electoral system. And, uh, you know, if the government wants something to go through, it just uses its majority to get that through. So we've seen that recently with some very um, controversial controls on political protests, for example. Um, the MPs, including my representative in Parliament, just voted through this stuff that's, in my view, just against basic civil and political rights. It was then um, stopped in, in the Lords, effectively, our second chamber, which is like a crazy chamber where people aren't even elected. So, so it's quite hard to, talking from the UK case, it's quite hard to compare. I think the European Parliament works as a, as a proper Parliament, and I think we need to change our domestic Parliament so that MPs are actually legislators and they have a specific area in which they legislate like how, like how it works in the European Parliament. I don't know how other parliaments work, but the British one is not a good example to follow. Um, and when you went into COP26, what were your aims? Were they met and why or why not were they? I don't know. So I think the most important thing that needed to to happen at COP was that we needed some sort of climate justice and that means of course that the um, countries that have used more CO2 and that have built up their wealth using CO2 stop using fossil fuels as quickly as possible but also that they compensate the countries that are suffering the immediate damage from climate change much more severely so you know countries like the Philippines suffering from hurricanes or the drought that's affecting the Sahel or the flooding in Bangladesh or the inundation of um, Pacific Island countries that's the priority for climate change helping those countries using the wealth we've accumulated through centuries of burning oil and coal and gas you know to, to, to help those countries so what they call climate justice loss and damage we made a tiny bit of progress on that because it got mentioned in the agreement and they say they will come up with a, a further agreement at the next talks in Sharm el Sheikh. So obviously the pressure's on to make sure that happens. But the other thing I wanted to see, I mean, what we tend to see is promises that politicians make that future politicians will have to fulfill. Like if you're a politician now and you promise something by 2050, you know nobody's going to hold you to that because you'll be long gone by then. We've seen an awful lot of that. What we haven't seen is the practical policies and measures to make the carbon dioxide reductions happen. And for me, the most important one of those is a carbon tax, because that will make the production of CO2 
more expensive right now and increasingly expensive through time. And um, it's really a lever on the whole economy. And until we have a, a global carbon tax, or at least a carbon tax in some of the significant major economies, I just don't believe they'll meet the targets they've set themselves. So COP was a great disappointment because it was the usual thing where people just do a lot of grandstanding. You know, they perform all this stuff and they're on the stage there um, making promises, but there's absolutely nothing in terms of policy change to back up those promises. So that's essentially betraying um, the future generations of the world. Okay. Um, and when you're at, an, uh, at such an event, do is it kind of already decided before it happens <laughs> you know i'm very few people get into the actual negotiation so that's the heart of what happens at cop the un negotiators so there's representatives from um, governments of all the countries of the world um and then you have the what they call the blue zone and that's where you have to be a delegate to go in there um so quite a lot of greens were in there but i I, you know, I didn't even try to get in there. So I'm now in the green zone, which is like effectively a sort of corporate advertising tent. You know, it's like some enormous trade show where everybody's saying, you know, oh, here's how Formula One can contribute to sustainability. Here's how the games industry can, you know, everybody just comes along and makes their pitch. At least that's how it was in Glasgow. It wasn't anything like that in Paris, actually. Um, and then outside that, you have the sort of fringe, which is where all the campaigners are and where all the real ideas are discussed and all the activity is. And so the, the Greens had a, a church hall centre that we used and we had a lot of meetings there. So we were discussing our ideas like carbon tax, like climate justice. What does that mean? Like climate reparations. But, you know, inside the actual negotiations, um, there's a yeah, there's a tiny number of people. Did did we know what was going to come out at the beginning? Not entirely, I think. And obviously, the the big change, which was to remove the um, text that said we were going to eliminate fossil fuels and substitute it with a text that said we were just going to phase them down. So switching phasing down, phasing out to phasing down, that literally appeared to happen as a sort of ambush at the last minute by India and China. So I don't. I mean, even Alok Sharma who was the COP president, wasn't expecting that. So think, I mean, you have the parameters, obviously, and there's all this diplomacy ahead of the talks where people explain what they're going to agree to and what's going to happen, you know, how far they'll go and where their red lines are. But you could see that actually the final agreement is subject to last minute, and in this case, rather underhand um, negotiations. And I imagine that China and India said, you have to change that word or we're just, you know we'll walk out and there'll be no agreement so yeah it was a it was a nasty negotiation at the end okay um and so my next questions are about your new book sustain called sustainable finance um so we were talking about this in the beginning where you're talking about um incentives for subsidizing um big fossil fuel companies and I think your book explains how to reverse these incentives. Can you talk about, about that? Yeah, well, the thing is with that book, it, it was largely um, drawing on what I'd done as a member of the European Parliament. So when I'm working in that setting, obviously I have to take into account the need to get a, an agreement, you know, a compromise across, with different political parties who are far less ambitious in terms of sustainability than I am. So in that context, really, the best thing we can do is to introduce these very strong incentives into markets. And um, so, yeah, I, I would have liked a carbon tax there, but, you know, my, my colleagues wouldn't agree with that. So that the kind of thing we're talking about is just making it clear that it will become more expensive to pr produce carbon dioxide. And also, a lot of the work that's done in sustainable finance is actually around reporting. So um, I worked on the um, mandatory disclosure directive, which is called, um, they, they always come up with these abbreviations, <coughs> nobody can remember, it's called SFDR, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. It's a regulation, not a directive. Um, and so that means that all financial companies across Europe have to report the ESG impacts of their investments. So environmental, including climate impacts, social impacts, uh, including you know, human rights standards and governance impacts. So for example, do they have workers represented on their boards? So 
now all the banks and investment companies and pension funds and so on across the European Union market have to report the impacts of their activities on those, um, you know, in those different ways. And that's starting to open up the black box of finance. So at the moment, if I say I have a pension fund, the company might go off and cut down rainforest in um, Indonesia, you know, where all the orangutans now become extinct um, and plant palm oil plantation, right? And I don't even know that's happening with my money. In future, those sort of impacts will be much clearer to the customer and that will give people a chance to move their money into uh, more ethical funds and away from the environmentally and socially destructive funds. And will it be, uh, so is it already implemented or is it coming in? Yeah, it came in on the 10th of March last year. I think it's tightening up again this year, so it covers more people. But yes, it's already in operation now, and it's the first mandatory disclosure regime anywhere in the world. So there's a lot of voluntary agreements, but often that just deteriorates into greenwashing and promises. But this, obviously, I tried to make it extremely scientifically verifiable. We'll see in practice how much that works. But um, yeah, everybody at least has to do that reporting. And for now, are we seeing the positive impact? Do you know what? That's one of the things I'm hoping I'll be able to research myself. It's a bit too early now. It's only just not even a year yet, but I'm hoping I might persuade somebody to, to fund me for a research project to look into that because I think the answer will probably be yes and no. It usually is, isn't it? I think there will be, I think seeing mandatory disclosure coming across the horizon focuses the minds of people that, you know, the accountants working in those companies. Um, but whether they focus their minds on actually changing things or changing the way they report things to make it look better, that's the crucial question. And that depends on how strongly the reporting standards were written and how well they're monitored and um, yeah, whether there are proper sanctions. So that is indeed something that I would like to, you know, come back to me in a couple of years and maybe I'll have done that research or somebody else will. Okay. Um, uh, okay, I think, this is my last question, but what is the role of central and public banks in funding the transition to sustainability? That is a big question. So the, the first thing we have to say is that it's extraordinary that everybody's agreeing that we're in the middle of a climate crisis and a sustainability crisis, and yet banks are still funding all that dirty business that's causing those problems. So all the central banks in the world are, so any private bank, has a central bank standing behind it and behind the central bank stand us as the citizens. So in the UK, we have the Bank of England. If banks start going bust, the Bank of England will bail them out. I will have to pay for that through my taxes. So I think that gives me a right to say not only how the central bank behaves, but also how those individual bank behaves, banks behave in terms of their lending. At the moment, the central bank mandate has two objectives. One is financial stability. So they're focused on the risk-taking activity of those banks. And the other one is inflation. So they make sure they don't make it so cheap to borrow money that that's fueling inflation, right? Those are the only two things they have to do. But we also need to add something in there now that says that they should encourage um, lending in the direction of sustainability and climate action. And they should discourage lending towards environmentally destructive activities. That should be in the mandate of the central bank. The, the Bank of England mandate was changed recently so that it, it moves in that direction, but not far enough. So the, you know, the banking licenses, the Bank of England stands behind banks in the UK that have a banking license. There need to be conditions on those licenses. For example, a minimum amount of lending that should go towards renewables, invest, um, insulation of people's homes, pollution control, and so on. And there should be a, a phasing out of any lending to fossil fuels. So, you know, let's say over the next four or five years, banks that hold a banking license and have this ability to create money through lending should not be allowed to create that money and lend it to um, fossil fuel industries. Essentially, we need the, this isn't like a, it's not a market system. It's not a system where businesses are making decisions using their own money and um, judgment and entrepreneurship. We're talking about a system of the, the, the currency of our country and, what, and how we use that power of, of a, a reserve currency to do good rather than do harm. And at the moment, banking 
is working to maximize profits and creating a lot of harm. And yeah, we need the central banks to say, we're part of the solution here on climate change. We're a powerful actor in the national economy, and we're going to use that power to put conditions on banking licenses so that banks lend in the direction of sustainability rather than in the direction of, of pollution and climate crisis. Okay, well, those were all the questions I had. Here's a quick recap. We learned about the role that different actors play, how big companies have a big role in the environmental impact and how governments and central banks also have a huge responsibility in green economics. As usual, if you have any additional thoughts on the topic, please leave it in the comments down below and thank you for watching. There may be trouble ahead, but while there's moonlight and music and love and romance, let's face the music and dance.